statistical mathematical fact. Never has been down. Has broken every single record. There is no asset that has come close. It's the only thing in the industry that was not touched, that was not hacked, and it never fails doing what it promised in 2009. It's never What's failed. What's the best performing asset the world has ever seen? And you'll Many find people out committed that it's a bit 15 hard. years ago, 14 years ago, 12 years ago, where the Satoshi, the next level downward, down, is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny. And because it's so small from a U.S. dollar denominated price, people are disrespecting it. They're not paying too much attention to it. It's meaningless to them. But this is the same movie played over and over and over again. It's the same error being made again. It's the same grand mistake that will ultimately leave the vast majority of people on the outside of this miraculous thing looking on the inside. I've decided to dedicate a big portion of my professional life pounding the table on the fact that our our window of opportunity to get one full Bitcoin or more is closing very rapidly. Our opportunity to get one half of one full Bitcoin is closing very, very rapidly. And soon it will be one quarter of a Bitcoin will be closing very rapidly. And then one tenth of a full Bitcoin will be closing very rapidly. And then we will be living in a world of Bitcoin dust. Um, I use that to, to, to use a gold and old gold analogy, um, where the vast majority of people at certain point were carrying around on their persons little leather pouches with gold dust to pay for things. And I believe that we are quickly, rapidly approaching the era of Bitcoin dust Satoshis. And we will live the vast majority of our, we will live the vast majority of our later lives. And, and of course, for decades, decades in the future and centuries in the future at the Satoshi level. There might come a time where Satoshis are too big of a unit to measure. And then we will have to, um, the Bitcoin network will have to um, have a change made to it to subdivide the Satoshi into a micro Satoshi. I believe that that is coming. So um, that is, um, I'm trying to be the voice that that makes you look at this. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to be the voice for those of you who are not seeing this as of yet to just basically look. I'm not telling you or encouraging you to believe me. I'm trying to encourage you to look because belief is something that does not fit in the Bitcoin um, ethos. This is not something to believe. This is something to know. This is not something to trust Oliver Velez in what Oliver Velez is saying. It is something to know. Trust has existed for a very long time and has been a necessity for a very long time because the things that we seek in life, the things of value have always been in the hands of other human beings. The things that we have garnered as valuable in our lives, we have been locked in a system where we have to hand them over to other men. We work for certain value our entire lives. We attempt to amass things that last, things that have value, things that we might be able to pass on to our next generation. But we have been on a plantation in a, in a way that compels us to take the things that we work for and to trust them to other men. And history has proven that the trust of our value placed in the hands of other men have been a, a, a tremendous failure, that that trust has been violated decade after decade, century after century, millennia after millennia. And so Bitcoin has arised in our lives to eliminate the need for trust, to eliminate the need for us as human beings to work for value and hand that value over to other men that claim, that promise to take care of us, that promise to take care of our future, that promise to keep what we've worked for in good standing. That has never worked. It, it has never worked on Wall Street. It has never worked for of the banking system in the past. It has never worked for in, in any system. And so trust is, the need for trust is the sign that you are operating in a broken system. A system that is true does not require trust. 
It simply requires knowing. So once again, I am attempting to be that voice that helps you get to a place where you simply know. And therefore, you no longer have to trust. Remember, if you have to trust, it means you don't know. All right, guys. So today, actually, I wanted to have a quick talk to talk with you. I don't know how quick it's going to be. I'm going to try to make it quick. I always do. Um, I want to talk about how, uh, what did I name this talk, actually, by the way? I just want to make sure I get the title right. Um, I want to talk to you about how Bitcoin allows us to profit from greed and corruption. Now, before I delve into this topic, for those of you who are listening to me for the very first time here on X.com, I just want to let you know that I don't have I don't hold your typical Twitter space. Um, I do not pass the mic. So your attempts to request the mic are going to go for naught. I apologize about that. I feel that the best way I've found to deliver my limited amount of information and knowledge that I have is best done in a monologue form. I do try to take some of your questions if I feel I haven't gone too long. So please feel free to ask your questions. Um, and every single one of my live sessions does wind up on my Bitcoin podcast entitled Bitcoin Unleashed. Um, if you find anything I have to say tonight of value, I strongly encourage that you seek out that Bitcoin podcast, Bitcoin Unleashed. It is on Spotify. It is on YouTube. It's on um, Fountain App. It's on all of your all of your popular pod, uh, pa podcasting platforms. Uh, make sure you follow that and take in some of the uh, other talks. I try to make most of what I talk about um, evergreen in nature, meaning that um, you'll be able to come back to these talks a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, and still gain, glean some value from them because it, it, what I talk about, I try not to make it so specific to a current event. And after two weeks, that talk is meaningless. Um, I try to talk about things that will um, gnaw at life forever for the most part. And so with with that being said, let me let's delve into um, what I wanted to discuss with you today. Greed and corruption has been a part of the human experience for time immemorial. And I don't think that I have to convince anyone who's listening to me at this time, whether it's live or in a recorded fashion. I'm sure I don't have to convince any of you that greed and corruption are not going anywhere any, any, anytime soon. That as long as we are human beings, there will be greed. It is just baked into the, the human species. It is part of our DNA. And I believe that because there will always be greed, that greed will lead to corruptive ways. That greed will always lead to corruption. And so... In a real sense, greed and corruption are inextricably intertwined. You cannot separate one from the other. Greed is one side of the coin and corruption is a guaranteed other side of that same coin. And so greed and corruption have been with us from the beginning. And greed and corruption will be with the human race until the very end. And what I find so fascinating about Bitcoin is that its very nature, its very existence is actually tied to greed and corruption. That in fact, Bitcoin utilizes greed and corruption. But get this, it utilizes it in reverse. And that is the message that I want, that I hope that I'm successful in communicating to you, that Bitcoin is the mirror image of greed and corruption. So whatever direction greed and corruption move, Bitcoin moves in the opposite direction. It is literally the antithesis of greed and corruption. It's the other side. It's the other way. It's the other side of a seesaw, if you will. When you push down greed and corruption, you raise Bitcoin. And there is no way to stop. 
this relationship. And so let me give you some of my thoughts on this, and you let me know what you think about this. The first thing I want to mention connected to this topic, um, well, the first thing I think that's necessary for us to do is to delve into the lifespan of think of certain things such as fiat currencies. Now, a fiat currency is a money that is man-made. It is created by a controlling body like a government, and it is made money by the government or made money by a group or an organized group or a faction, if you will. And it is this money is basically made money by law or it is deemed as money simply because the group, the organization or the com country says it's money. Now, this is what fiat currency is. It's important to understand the nature of fiat currency to understand what we're going to talk about today. Fiat currencies, fiat monies, they are man-made items. But what's interesting is that money historically has never been made by a man. You see, human beings have never regarded money as a man-made item. No monies throughout history have ever been monies that were made by man. They were deemed to be made by God, whether it were gold, whether it was silver at some point, whether it was agri beads in, in agri beads in Africa, whether it was the rye stones in the Yap Islands. Stones are not made by man. Beads are not made by the material of beads are not made by men. Seashells are not made by man. Gold is not made by man. Silver is not made by man. Tobacco is really not made by man. It's farmed by man, but it's not made by man. Money throughout history has never been made by man. And so how do we come to a money that is made by man? It's a relatively new experiment. The fiat currency experiment, the experiment of a man making his own money is the newest experiment of all in the grand scheme of money's history. This is a brand new experiment and the experiment of man being able to make his own money. This experiment is failing miserably. This experiment is not old in the grand scheme of things either. From the vantage point of man, mankind's history, it is a very, very short period of time that this experiment is going on. And one might say that the experiment in earnest started um, in 1971. And that's just a little more than 50 years ago. And that's not very long at all from an historical point of view, from money's historical point of view. But in less than 50 years, the fiat currency experiment is crumbling and it's crumbling faster than most people think. It's an utter failure. Why? Because man was not intended to make his own money. But I digress in a little bit, a little bit. Let's get back to the point. Fiat currencies, because they are made by men, by a man, they are by design, they are by design intended to trend towards zero forever. That is, in other words, until they die. A fiat currency by its very design is intended to die. It's intended to lose value forever. A fiat currency can never gain var value over time because a fiat currency's existence, its very nature is to be printed more and more. You see, you don't create a fiat currency and stop. And that's it. You don't create a supply of it and stop. The only way to stop the fiat currency that a man, a group of men have created and deemed as money is to kill everyone that made it, to kill everyone. It's not going to happen. The very nature of a man making his own money is to create more and more of it. And so by 
creating more and more of your own money, if that is the goal of a fiat currency, to be able to create your own money, the very creation of your own money sends it to zero because every new dollar to pick one of the fiat currencies, every new dollar you create devalues all of the existing dollars you created before. So if you created $100 and you create another $1, now the entire pool of value is broken up over 101 units, whereas that before the total value was divided by 100 units. So now each of the 100 units has to give one one hundredth of its value to the new entrant, the new U.S. dollar that has come to be part of the family. If you create 10, if you start off with $100 and you create 10 new units, now you have $110. Well, every single one of the previously existing $100 has to give up a little piece of itself to give the new 10 units value. So every new unit robs value from all the existing units. And this is what a fiat currency does. It's very, by its very design, it is brought into existence to be expanded. It is brought into existence to be created. It's very continual creation devalues all the existing units until all the existing units get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller all the way to zero. Every fiat currency trends towards zero by its very design, by its very nature. They all go to zero. They all fail. And there are very few things that have a 100% failure rate in life or a 100% success rate, I should say. And fiat currencies have that success rate. They successfully go to zero 100% of the time. And so I, at times, am floored by the fact that I get pushback on this when this is something that almost every human being should know, that no currency lasts forever, that it go. All fiat currencies have gone to zero. You don't see any Roman denariuses floating around today. Where are there any German marks except in a frame somewhere to commemorate what used to be? There are no German marks. There are real, there's no Italian lira floating around today. They all come and go. All of them. They all go to zero. And so that's the first thing I think that needs to be understood. Now, um, the overall lifespan of a fiat currency, and you can search this yourself if you like. You can do it right now while I'm speaking to you. Search the, the average lifespan of a fiat currency. And what you'll find is that it, the, the average lifespan of these man-made monies, they last anywhere between 27 and 35 years. That's right. All the cemetery of fiat currencies is much larger than the living realm of fiat currencies. And the cemetery is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, where, where all fiat currencies go to die. And of course, as fiat currencies die, others kind of prop up into existence and they start trending toward the cemetery as well. But there are more currencies dead today than, than, than are alive today. And the average lifespan is 27 to 35 years. Now, some might say, well, Oliver, what about the U.S. dollar? The U.S. dollar has lasted well beyond 35 years. Well, 25, 27 to 35 years. Well, fiat currencies sort of fall into, currencies fall into two groups. There's your regular fiat currencies that are man-made by countries that do not have tremendous power. These are the monies, the currencies that have this 27 to 35 year lifespan. Then there's a sep separate, more special category, for lack of a better term, called world reserve currencies. 
These world reserve currencies are the monies that are created by the men that control major empires, I should say, major economic powers in the world. So there've always been there's always existed groups or countries or empires that are more powerful than others and their monies, the monies that they create and deem by law as being money for their people, these monies do last longer and the average lifespan of a world's reserve currency like the British pound was, like the US dollar today, like um uh, I forget what the Spanish currency was called, but there was the the Dutch, the Portuguese was the world had the world reserve currency at one point. The Spanish had the world reserve currency at one point. Great Britain had the world reserve currency at one point, and today the U.S. the United States has the world reserve currency. The lifespan for world reserve currencies is not 27 to 35 years. It's longer. It's 99 years. Now, like I said, I am not making these numbers up. You can go do the research yourself. All right, so you have these two levels of currencies, these two levels of man-made monies in this brand new experiment. For the most part, um, the regular man-made monies last 27 to 35 years. They die and new ones are created. And then the world reserve ones last 99 years. They die until the, another world, world power rises on the scene and says, no, now this is the world's money. All right, so I'm glad we got that out of the way. Now, monies over time have becoming have have gone through this process of becoming more and more fiat-like. So prior to 1971, there was a percentage of the money had fiat characteristics, and there were other percentages of that money that had connections to monies that were made by God, for lack of a better word. So there was a time where these currencies were tied to the God money. So they were sort of split. A portion of it was fiat-like, a portion, and the fiat portion was tied to God money. In 1971, the God money was eliminated. The God-like, the, the, the God-created money was taken away. And now what was left was pure man-made money. And so there were kind of these two phases, right, where man made his own money but tied it to God's money. That was phase one of the fiat movement. And phase two of the fiat movement was let's take God out of it. Let's take God money out of the money and let's just keep it all for ourselves. We are the 100% money. We don't need God's money to be connected to our money. We control the issuance. We control the supply. We don't want the restraints that the God part of the money ties to our, our money. So they severed the man-made portion of the money from the God money. And so now it is totally paper money. It is totally man-made totally control no restrictions that's where the greed and corruption just goes through the roof that they are not checked by the god money they are not held in restraint by the god part of the equation the god money part of the equation the money that can't be made by god by man but can only be made by god and i'm using god in the general nature like sense that it comes from the earth it comes from existence itself it does not come from the 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 fabrication of man all right and so um it's important to understand this because most people have a almost zero level of understanding about money its history where it's come from the phases it's gone through most people don't understand that 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 humans have never chosen have never had a money that was 100% created from scratch by a man, controlled by a man. That is a recent experiment starting in 1971. 
All right. They were inching toward that way before 71. And, and in 71, it just went 100% that way. So it's important to understand these lifespans. There's 27 to 35 years in the um, fiat currencies or the, the man-made man -made monies by countries that don't dominate the economy of the world. And then there, there are the monies that are man-made by the economic powers of the world. They're called world reserve currencies. And they have a lifespan not of 27 to 35 years, but of 99 years. Now, now um, the... Uh, I believe, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. I gave you the wrong number. It's actually the average is 94 years. Um, I'm giving you 99 years because the current world reserve currency, the U.S. dollar, has been in existence for 99 years. But the average lifespan of a world reserve currency is 94 years. Um, and the U.S. dollar is at its 99th year um, as being the um, world reserve currency. Now, I think it's also important to understand what the average lifespan of an empire is or has been. So there are the, there's the monies. We've talked about the two different types, the world reserve monies and other regular monies. Then there's the empires themselves. What's the average lifespan of an empire? It's actually, uh, according to the work of John um, John Begat Gloob, I think his name is. He was a British soldier who wrote a book in 1978 called The Fate of Empires, if my memory serves me correctly. It's a book I read a long time ago. But anyway, in his book, he studied 11 empires, um, starting all the way back from the ancient, ancient Assyria to modern Britain, Great Britain. And according to his work, the average lifespan of an empire was 250 years. So these three levels, I want you to keep note of. The average lifespan of a, of a regular fiat currency is 27 to 35 years. The average lifespan of a world reserve currency is 94 years. The average lifespan of an empire dating back thousands of years, empires are not forever either. They last on average, dating back all the way thousands and thousands of years, just about 250 years. Now, um, what was interesting about the work laid out in the fate of empires is that um, Mr. Gloop detailed how these empires basically rise and fall. And based on his work, he stated that these empires always go through six phases, right? So the first phase they go through is called the age of pioneers. So what starts an, an empire off and on its journey toward power is that it's basically driven by a bunch of pioneers. That phase morphs into phase two, which is the age of conquest. These pioneers sort of span out and start conquering so pioneers lead to the eight the age of pioneers leads to the age of conquests then after conquests are made that brings about the age of commerce the age of business and after the age of business that age of business leads to the age of affluence success the age of affluence leads to the fifth stage, which is the age of the intellect. And the age of the intellect drives the empire to its final stage, stage six or age six, called the age of decadence. And it's the age of decadence that does the empire in. Now, if we were to look at the United States through the eyes of these six ages which age do you think we are in are we in the age of pioneers oh, that was a while ago are we in the age of conquests mm, no that was a while ago too what about the age of commerce one might argue that we are in the age of commerce but 
we've been in the rocking in the age of commerce for quite some time. Age of affluence? I would say the greatest affluential period of all was the 1800s into the early part of the 1900s. The age of the intellect? Oh, I'd say that's the 60s into the internet era. I'd say, I'd gander to say that we are in the age of decadence right now. And that is the age where everything sort of goes haywire. But this also fits with the average lifespan of an empire, 250 years. What birthday did the United States basically have recently? So it fits in terms of the average life it, the average lifespan of an empire is 250 years it also fits with the average lifespan of a world reserve currency 90 94 years the us dollar is a world reserve currency for 99 years all of these things are lining up to suggest something people that we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning and so that leaves the middle are we closer to the middle than we are to the end and i'd say based on these numbers 94 years average lifespan of a world reserve currency world reserve currency 99 years average lifespan of an empire 250 years we're already past that And so all of these things would suggest that we are in the sixth age of an empire's lifespan. There are other signs that suggest this as well. In this final stage of an empire, what you primarily get is that the investors in the empire start to divest themselves. And so from a U.S. perspective, you know, you have fewer and fewer buyers of the debt, which is the global asset for the world, right? U.S. treasuries. So fewer and fewer purchasers of the debt. In fact, a higher and higher level of selling the debt, more divesting oneself of the world reserve currencies or the empire's debt asset that stage that's that's one sign that's we certainly have that and you have the central bank having to print its own currency to make up for the lack of the buying of the debt that used to happen before the Less buying of the debt, which means less investment in the empire, less buying of the debt, sign one, sign two, central bank of that world world power has to print its own money. Remember, we talked about how every time you print an extra fiat dollar, you devalue all of its other dollars. So the central bank has to now print its own money to buy its own debt because it doesn't have the buyers it used to have, that's sign two, and then rapid decline in the purchasing power of that world reserve currency because the central bank is printing it to buy its own debt. All of these three things are historically rooted in the age of decadence and the final stage of an empire. Now, I will tell you this, I'm an optimist at heart. Um, I just always think the future is better. And I, and I do, I still think the future is better. I don't want anyone to misconstrue me giving, trying to give somewhat of a broad historical lesson on the history of money, the lifespan of money in empires and things of this nature, but we can't be blind to history. And there are a lot of people who say, well, Oliver, um, you know, the past is not a guarantee of the future. 
Yeah, but it's the only thing we have. We only have the past to use to judge what the future might be. Because if you stop looking at the past, then what do you have? Nothing. So I do understand that the past is not totally a guarantee of future occurrences, but it's the only thing that we have to use. So do you not use it? No. And I, what the past has shown is that that pattern that I just laid out for you has happened 100% of the time. And so how do you not look at that? How do you not delve into that? How do you not just be aware of that? How do you, how do you ignore something with a 100% accuracy rate? That would be the height of naivety. And that's being dumb. It's the height of dumb. Not the height of naivety. That's the height of ignorance. That's the height of stupidity to ignore that. So we can't ignore these things, right? We can't ignore these things. So over time, if you were to do a little more study of what I just laid out, you'd find that these cycles, these six ages of an empire from boom to bust, this average lifespan of a currency, that these cycles get smaller and shorter and shorter over time, like every single thing else does in the universe. It, they don't slow down, they speed up. So there was a time where your average empire lasted a thousand plus years. Now the average lifespan of an empire is 250 years. And the average lifespan of a world power will go down from 250 years to 100 years and 50 years and onward and onward. There was a time where your world reserve currency was longer than 94 years, was maybe hundreds of years. The Roman denarius lasted hundreds of years, but the average lifespan of a world reserve currency today is 94 years and will continue to trend toward zero. These cycles of boom to bust, they don't get slower, they get faster. The same way technologies are never adopted slower than the prior technologies, they're always adopted faster. Cycles speed up forever. They never go in the opposite direction. So where does this all tie into my talk about how Bitcoin allows us to profit from greed and corruption. Well, if Bitcoin is tied to the opposite of what a currency is, then it must go up forever in value. Now, hear me out. Think about this. If a fiat currency is designed to go towards zero, to go down in value forever until it no longer exists, then Bitcoin, by, being vir by virtue of it being the very opposite of that, must go up in value forever. You see, Bitcoin is the other side of the seesaw. If you push the fiat side of the seesaw down, the Bitcoin side has to go up. Well, someone says, well, Oliver, well, what happens when the fiat currency is zero? There's another one that starts. There's another one that pops up and starts going to zero. And that starts a new phase of acceleration for Bitcoin. And when that one goes to zero, when that world reserve currency goes to zero, another one pops up and starts the movement towards zero. There's another phase of Bitcoin going toward infinity. And because fiat currencies will never stop going down, Bitcoin will never stop going up. And whenever I explain this to people, you know, whenever I explain this to some of my followers, my traders and things of that nature, but Oliver, you know, and I love when they struggle with it because it brings it out more. They say, well, Oliver, um, 
what happens if fiat currencies don't come into existence anymore? Well, then you have an almost perfect world. We move to a system where money is not no longer made by a man. No, its issuance is not in the control of a human being. Its supply can't be moved, manipulated, or controlled by other men. And now you have a system that is 100% fair. 100% available to every human being on earth, yet not controllable, confiscatable, or manipulated by any human being on earth. That might be a long way off. And why will currencies always trend towards zero? Because of greed. If it costs nothing to create it, greed will ensure that it will always be created. I'm going to be honest with you. If I, Oliver Velez, as much as I care for you, and I do, believe it or not, that's why I do this. I don't ask you for anything. But if I had the money printer and something happened in my life where I needed something and I'm responsible for this money printer, now, I know that every time I, if I press the printer button to create more, it makes every other person with that money poorer by a little bit. And I know this, but something in my life happens and I need money. And all I have to do is press this button. I'm telling you, people... Bitcoiners, traders, followers, supporters, haters, I would print it on you. Oliver Velez would print it. I'm sorry. I would do it. I'll do it. And you know what? You'd do it too. Now, if I printed this money for my emergency, something happened to, God forbid, one of my children, and I needed it. And I printed it just this one time, and I printed the money, and I took care of my problem. My problem is solved. The printer allowed me to do that. And I sit and wait for the consequence. I know I'm going to have to pay for this. I'll just face it. And then I realize there's no consequence. That nobody freaking realized that I hit the print button. Everyone went about their normal lives. No one complained. No one said anything. No one changed one iota of their lives. They still watched the game on the weekend. They still took their kids to the movies. They still had their little skirmishes and fights with each other. Life stayed the same for them. And this would make it easier for me to press the print button again. So the next time something comes up, it's easier for me to press the print button on you. Why? Because you didn't do anything or say anything the first time. And I'll print it again the next time something comes up. And my reasons for printing it will get sloppier. You see, the first time it was because a, a loved one of mine was in trouble and I printed it, the money on you, and I solved it. The next time it was maybe not as serious, but still serious. And I printed it on you and you still said nothing. And so my reasons start to actually stop being emergency related and they start to be desire related. I walk across this Ferrari dealership and something about this new version of Ferrari just grabs me. 
And I know I can't really get it. I shouldn't get it. But I remember the printer button that I have access to. And I remember all the other times for these other emergencies that I printed for and nobody said anything. This is not an emergency, but I really like this Ferrari. I'm just going to print one more time just to get the Ferrari. That's when the greed steps in. And I print, I get the Ferrari, vowing to not do it again. And yet again, no one says anything. Not a single consequence, not a single blip, not a single whisper from a single soul. And so now I pass on a different day, another window and another window and another beautiful home and another vacation and another private jet and another grand party for my friends and another this for my loved ones and on and on it will go because there are no consequences for me to print it. My greed will take over. Now, I am telling you that is exactly what would happen with Oliver Velez, and I care about some of you. Think about a group of men who don't give a shit about you. Think about how they'll use the print button on you. But here's the thing, with Bitcoin, every single time they print, Bitcoin's value rises. Every time their greed takes hold of them, Bitcoin goes up. Every new dollar, Bitcoin goes up. Every corrupt act, Bitcoin goes up. Every time they debase you, Bitcoin goes up. Every time they lie to you, Bitcoin goes up. Every time they do bad by you, do wrong by you, Bitcoin goes up. Bitcoin is tied to their greed, Bit but the other way. Bitcoin is tied to their corruption, but the other way. For the first time in the history of human mankind, we profit from their corrupt corruption we profit from their greed we profit from their wrongdoing when you finally get this it is freaking insane people It's so insane that you have to be really careful because you find yourself rooting for corruption. You find yourself rooting for them to bring it all down. Yeah, the age of decadence, speed it up, baby. You wanna hit that, that big button? Let me dust the print button off for you. Print, baby, print, baby. That's not really the right way to be, but when you really get this, you got to catch yourself wishing for these things, hoping for these things. When you understand that Bitcoin is the other side of their actions, prior to Bitcoin, their actions harmed us. Prior to Bitcoin, their, their actions stole from us. They hurt our future. They robbed from our children's future. Jerome Powell just did a 60-minute talk, and he basically said the loud part out, the quiet part out loud, that the United States is on a fiscal path that is unsustainable, that it is spending more than it makes. We have to print to make, we have to print money to make up the difference, and this is stealing from the future of our kids. He said it out of his own mouth. This used to steal from the future of our kids. Today, 
if you have Bitcoin, it guarantees the future of your kids. It guarantees a better future. Greed will never stop. I don't care what Jerome Powell says. Greed will never stop and it will grow and grow and grow until the whole empire comes down. Corruption will never stop. It has been with us for ages. Every single empire was brought down by greed and corruption. And this, it is not going to suddenly stop by now. And for the first time, something came into existence that said, hey, wait a minute, let's just profit from this thing that will never go away. Let's profit from greed. Let's profit from corruption, but the right way. Let's let greed and corruption do its thing, but let by by virtue of its doing its thing, let it lift us to infinity. Because greed and corruption will send fiat currencies down towards zero forever, Bitcoin is going to rise forever, which means that your future will rise forever. The lineage, your bloodline will, will become better forever, wealthier forever, more secure forever, safer forever. For the first time, the future gets easier, not harder. In the fiat world, your life gets harder and harder. It was easier for your great, great grandparents. It was easier for your great grandparents. It was easier for your grandparents than it is for you. And it's easier for you than it is for your kids. So in a fiat world, the future gets harder. In a Bitcoin world, the future gets easier. And that's the way it should be, people. That is the way it was supposed to be from the beginning. And Bitcoin is bringing the way things were supposed to be back to the human race. I made a post today, several actually, on that harped on this same theme. In 2010, it took 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two pizzas. 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two pizzas. And some two pizzas, huh? In 2016, a mere six years later, it took 100 Bitcoin to buy a McLaren. Do you know what a McLaren car is? It's a terrible, it's a great performing car. It's terrible from a reliability point of view, but it's a very highly desired car. It took 100 Bitcoin to buy a McLaren in 2016. In 2010, it took 10,000 to buy a, a pizza that's gone in 20 minutes. In 2024, it takes 10 Bitcoin to buy basically your average home in the United States. Today, the statistics for an average home in the United States is just under $400,000. What's 10 Bitcoin at $40,000, $400,000. So we went from 10,000 Bitcoin buying two pizzas to only 10 Bitcoin buying a home. In late 2025, maybe it's going to be two Bitcoin that buys you your average home in America. And four years from that, maybe a half a Bitcoin. And four years from that, maybe a quarter of a Bitcoin. And four years from that, maybe a tenth of a Bitcoin. And four years from that, Satoshis. In a Bitcoin world, the future becomes easier, not harder. The future becomes more secure. The future becomes more creative because it gives you back your time. Imagine if your children or your great-grandchildren never had to worry about the lower part of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you know what Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid are your base needs, where you have to spend the vast majority of your time for food, clothing, shelter. There's, uh, there's 8 billion people on earth, and still to this very day, the vast majority of people are at the bottom of the pyramid, that they spend the vast majority of their lives until they die dedicated to getting food, clothing, shelter. They're still at level one. Above this level 
are things that are slightly more ethereal. The people that, that exist at the higher level spend, they they don't have to spend the majority of their time getting food, clothing, and shelter. That's kind of taken care of. And let's call the next level, I'm, 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 I'm squishing several levels together, but let's call the next level things like recognition, attention, um, status. You see, they've got, they don't have to spend their time putting a roof over their head or putting food in their mouth or putting a shirt on their back. They dedicate the majority of their time trying to get recognized, trying to get status, trying to get position in life. That's a higher level than the first one. And then there's another level above that where people spend their time just wanting to be loved. I just want to be special to someone and I want someone to be special to me. I want love. And even that's not the highest level. You see the highest level on Abraham Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs is called self-actualization. You see, the self-actualized individual doesn't have a need. There is no need for food, clothing, and shelter. That's already taken care of. So zero need there. There is no need for status. There's not even a need for love. The self-actualized individual doesn't have a need. And therefore, the self-actualized individual is total creativity. You see, creativity doesn't spring from a need. It just is. It comes into existence just because. And that's the highest level of being. Just because. Now I, and I hope you, I want my bloodline to be there. I don't want them to be a slave to a need. I don't want their actions to be reactions to something else. I just want them to live just because. To be able to do something just because. Not because they have to, not because they need to, just because I want them moved by creativity. And Bitcoin removes your needs. There is no need with Bitcoin now to gather up 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza. I did another post about a home in 2017, taking the average price of Bitcoin in 2017, it took 515 Bitcoin to buy a home in 2000, the average home in 2017, that the average home, I used $500,000 price of a home in 2017. It took 515 Bitcoin to buy a half a million dollar home in the United States today, today guys, it takes about 12, a little more than 12 Bitcoin to buy a half a million dollar home from 515 Bitcoin to 12. In 2008, maybe it's three, two. I mean, in 2005, in 2008, maybe it's one. In 2032, maybe it's a tenth of a Bitcoin. And if you extrapolate this out, your 
future generations if you never let this go. They will have no needs. There will be nothing on earth that they can't have access to, that they can't have. And it is when you have everything that you are self-actualized, there is no need. And you can live a 100% creative, self-actualized life. This is the path of the human species to go up that pyramid and to arrive at self-actualization. And Bitcoin is speeding that process up by removing our needs. There will come a time, and I believe you will see this in your lifetime, where one Bitcoin practically gets you anything you want. And that's powerful. And how can I be so sure that it's going there? Well, that was the crux of my talk today, wasn't it? It's guaranteed to go there because fiat currencies through greed and corruption are guaranteed to keep going down. Because fiat currency has no bottom, Bitcoin has no top. Because greed and corruption have no end, Bitcoin's rise has no end. And so I ask you people, if anything that I've said tonight resonates with you, why are you not working harder? Why are you not stacking harder? If this resonates with you, why are you preoccupied with minutia like the current price today when we're talking about infinity tomorrow? It is not about what Bitcoin is right now at this second in U.S. dollar terms. Greed will continue, which means its rise will continue. Fiat currency will continue to decline, which means that Bitcoin will continue to rise. If the future is higher, why are you worried about what it is today? That doesn't even make sense. 30,000, 35,000, 40,000, 50,000. You think this matters now? Based on what we discussed here today, you think that is significant? Who cares whether you pick it up for 39,000 versus 43,000 versus 53,000? Nope, that should not even freaking come into the equation. It's minutia. It's going up forever, Laura. And if no one in the year in late 2025 is going to be worried about a $40,000 price, and no one in 2028 is going to even believe you bought it at $40,000, who cares what the price is right now? It's not important. What's important is getting enough of it. Because 10000 used to be too big two pizzas and now 10 is a whole house in the richest country in the world the people who were worried about price in 2010 they will die disappointed the people who were worried about price in 2012 will die disappointed i promise you in 2014 they're going to die disappointed in 2016 and 2018, even in, in, 20, in 2020, when I started at, at just under $4,000, you know how many people, when I got into Bitcoin, the lowest price I bought was 3,800. People were telling me it was going to 1,000. That why am I buying there? It's too high. It's dropping to 1,000. They still don't have Bitcoin. They will die disappointed. Don't let that be you. We've got 15 years of people who are going to die 
disappointed because their egos won't let them buy at this price when they could have bought at 10 cents or $10 or $10,000. Their ego won't let them do it. And their bloodline is going to fault them for an eternity. Don't let this be you people. All right, guys, that's my talk for today. Uh, I never really know where these things are going to go. I, I start off with um, a couple of points I want to I want to get across to you, and it sort of takes on a life of itself. Uh, I hope I didn't ramble too much on you. But um, let me see if there are any questions. Maybe I can uh, take a few of your questions here. And uh, I don't want to be too long, though, because when these sessions are too long, you just don't listen. <laughs> Uh, the the BTC guy, Bitcoin, this is incredible. I really appreciate that post. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time, brother. I thank you, Derek, for being here, truly. Um, guys, I know that you could be doing so many different things with your time. And in and, and truth, I believe that Bitcoin is one of, if not the most valuable thing that human beings can aspire, aspire to today. But uh, one thing that Bitcoin will never be more valuable than, and that is your time. And in a sense, Bitcoin is time. But your time is the most precious commodity you have. And the fact that you decide to give a portion, a very small portion of it to me, is something I don't take for granted because... You can't ever get this time back. So what I decided a long time ago, I've been speaking on the topic of financial freedom for the last three decades, guys. And I continue to do that. And today, the majority of my talks are dominated by Bitcoin, not 100%, but almost 100% today. And I made a vow three decades ago that I was going to respect anyone's time that they gave to me because they wouldn't ever be able to get it back. And I've tried my very best to make sure that every single thing that I give, and I don't only really give it from my heart, I give it with great intentions, but I try to give something that will take root and germinate and pay forever. I believe that what we talked about here today, some of you might not still accept it. But I do believe that it's with you now. And I believe that that thing, that kernel that's with you, will at some point take root. It'll germinate and it will grow. And at some point in the future, it'll flower into something that you see and recognize. Why do I believe that? Because it's the truth. And that is what the truth does. Traders, Bitcoiners, thank you once again. Once again, I appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening, your morning, your afternoon, um, whatever part of the world you're in. And all I'll leave you with is go to work. Go to work, people. A window of time is closing. Go to work. Stack harder. Ciao for now. Boo! My name is Oliver Velez, and I am your 13 percenter Bitcoiner. Be safe out there, and until next time. Boo!